Hello. Our story begins inside the Invisible Hand. Asuka was traveling with Obi-Wan and Anakin. Initially, she was outraged at the idea that Kenobi would make a move for Coruscant, despite the importance of saving Mandalore. But information was revealed by Obi-Wan about the entire situation on Mandalore. She didn't know it, because Bo never explicitly said anything about it, but the entire war on Mandalore was started from within. Sure, it was Maul who got them to take control over Sundari, but without the backing of Death Watch, that dream would have never come to fruition. Ahsoka knew she could go there and fight Maul, potentially even kill him. But the truth is, if the Mandalorians were willing to throw away their peace for war, then perhaps it wasn't something that she could fix as a non-Mandalorian. Ahsoka was split on the decision, but decided last second to join Obi-Wan and Anakin as they returned to Coruscant. She wanted the war to end anyways, so why not be there to help it come to its conclusion? It was a strenuous situation to be in, and she wasn't really sure if she was ready to return to combat in such a large scale. Turns out she was. Due to her master's training and the Jedi's acceptance of the war, she was more a warrior than a Jedi had any right to be. The 501st was split up, and now Commander Appa was leading the Siege of Mandalore alongside Bo-Katan. The mission was approved by the Council, but Ahsoka simply wasn't going now. As the three Jedi moved throughout the Invisible Hand, they came across the Chancellor inside the tower on the vessel. They quickly moved down to his side and prepared to free him from his captivity. That is, until Dooku showed himself. He referred to them as Jedi, and they turned around preparing to face him. Ahsoka had never faced off against Dooku before, so she was in uncharted territory. She was still a little rusty with her lightsabers as it was, and taking on someone like Dooku would be challenging. But Obi-Wan and Anakin were there. There was a little back and forth before the engagement began. The Jedi moved in unison, but they were a little off time, due to having been separated for several months. Dooku very quickly used his lightsaber to defend himself, swinging it back and around to make sure the Jedi couldn't beat him. He knew his main objective was pushing Skywalker further into the dark side, so he threw Obi-Wan back and then sidestepped Ahsoka, shooting electricity into her back. She was thrown to the ground and seemed to be knocked out on impact. Skywalker and Dooku continued backwards, and Obi-Wan re-engaged. At that particular moment, Dooku used the force to throw the Jedi Master across the room and bring the catwalk down on top of him. The duel between Anakin and Dooku resumed and they moved down from the balcony and fought aggressively. Ahsoka woke up when she heard Dooku talking about Anakin having greater power, and anger, but not using it. She turned her head and she could see Anakin pushing the Elder Sith backwards, before dragging his lightsaber down and cutting off both of his hands, and pulling Dooku's blade into his own. She was shocked, but she didn't believe Anakin would do anything with this. He was too kind-hearted to do anything as cruel as execute Dooku. However, Palpatine had other plans. He told young Skywalker to act, to kill Dooku now. He was too dangerous to be kept alive. There was a moment of silence. Dooku looked to his master with pure disbelief. As if it wasn't the same thing Sidious did the Maul after Qui-Gon's death, come on. Anakin hesitated, and Palpatine told him to do it. Ahsoka could feel it, and almost see it, as if the Force acted in the future. She could see Anakin drag his blades across Dooku's neck. She came back to the present, as if everything was moving in slow motion. She called out Anakin's name and ignited her lightsabers to get his attention. She was doing everything she could to pull him away from killing Dooku, and thankfully, it worked. Anakin turned back and Ahsoka's hand stretched outwards towards him. She said that it wasn't the Jedi way. They could bring Dooku to Coruscant, they could have him pay for his crimes. They could end the war, and he could be punished. There was no reason to kill him. He had already been defeated. Anakin nodded his head. She was right. His weapons deignited, and Palpatine scouted at Ahsoka. She didn't say anything, but there was tension between the two of them now. Sure, he wasn't responsible, but Sidious was her judge after all. The one who almost sent her to her death. She couldn't believe that he would try and force Anakin to kill an unarmed prisoner. While she had respect for him before, she didn't anymore. Ahsoka let it go for now. Instead, she and Anakin got to Obi-Wan and got him out of the tower. The events would lead them to being captured and then brought before General Grievous, the master collector of all lightsabers. He had some choice words and so did Anakin. All of it devolved into chaos. R2 created a distraction and the Jedi dispersed. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan made a move for Grievous while Anakin went to save Palpatine. In the chaos of the situation, Dooku snuck out of the way and used this opportunity to escape. The focus in the situation was on Grievous after all, because they knew they had defeated Dooku. With no hands, that kind of made him not a threat, so they targeted Grievous. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan had done this tussle with them before, and they got right back into it. With the help of Skywalker, they were able to beat back Grievous and stop him before he could make an escape. With all three Jedi fighting against the droid general, he was cut down and defeated. It was a humiliating loss too, but as was the way things went for him. 
he didn't stand a chance once they focused on him anyways. It was also at this point they realized that Dooku had escaped. Before they could try and find him and or capture him, the ship started to descend to the surface. Another happy landing accompanied by the deaths of an air traffic control team. Lovely. Palpatine would be returned to the Senate, and the Jedi would return to the Temple so that they could discuss the events on the Invisible Hand with the Council. Ahsoka was most on edge. She hadn't disclosed to Obi-Wan what she saw Palpatine try to do inside the Invisible Hand. Anakin wasn't present for the Council debriefing anyways, but this is where Ahsoka would inform them of what happened, and why she was almost wary of the Chancellor and his intentions with Anakin. Skywalker was clearly conflicted in that moment, not because he had any initial intentions to kill Dooku, but because he held the Clone Wars within his hands. The Council saw the actions of Ahsoka to be in line with her Jedi instruction, and believed that had she not been there, Anakin could have been brought towards the dark side. This shifted everything for the Jedi. They had a plan for what they were going to enact, but now it seemed too risky to put Anakin into that situation. Ahsoka did give Anakin extra credit here though. She said that he pushed back against the Chancellor, and the Council respected that, especially being that they knew how close Anakin and Palpatine were. That was a little out of proportion, but it was the truth. The Council then decided that they would make their decision regarding the entire situation. However, there was one final order of business that the Council wished to speak on. This more so came from Yoda than it did any other Jedi within the Council. He wanted to know if Ahsoka had any intentions to rejoin their order. She was reluctant. There was still so much bad blood between them, but the war was almost over. Early reports from Mandalore showed triumph for the Republic. With the Grand Army stretching out into Separatist territory, it was becoming clear that the war was coming to an end. So to Ahsoka, if the war was truly coming to an end, then it meant that the Jedi would return to normal behavior. She openly expressed to them that she would only rejoin on the account that they take more dedicated steps to ending the war. If they continue to elongate the war with their inaction, she wouldn't feel the need to stay. They were all kind of confused. The whole point of them fighting in this war was so that they could end it. Not a single member of the Council wanted the war to continue or be elongated. That was a clear misconception, but they expressed that they always had a desire to end the war. They were closer than ever, and they anticipated that the war would come to an end soon. With those words being spoken, she felt the call to return to the Order, making Ahsoka Tano a Jedi Knight, and Anakin Skywalker a Jedi Master. He wouldn't find out until later in the day when he returned to the Council with news that he was being appointed to the Council by Palpatine. The Jedi didn't really appreciate the move, but they decided to allow it. Anakin was a Jedi Master, and he was responsible for the defeat of both Grievous and Dooku in one way or another. They accepted it, but expressed to him that they did not condone the actions made by the Chancellor. They had to play this intelligently. If they allowed Palpatine to continue to play the Council, then he could garner more power for himself. The Jedi knew he was up to something, and now that they ruled out their plan for Anakin to spy on the Chancellor, they'd have to act in other ways. None of this really mattered to Anakin. He was on top of the world, he had his family, Ahsoka was a Jedi again, he was a Jedi Master, Grievous was dead, and the war was almost over. However, not all things are as it seems. When the night came, Skywalker would have his first waves of nightmares revolving around the death of his wife at childbirth. At the same time across the galaxy, Dooku was preparing for his great revenge. He realized that at the end of everything he had done in his life, especially the last 13 years of it, he had done for nothing. Sidious would take over the galaxy and establish a more corrupt regime than the Republic. Dooku had obviously done some heinous things in his life, so he wouldn't just turn back to the light. No, he had a plan for revenge. And who would be better of an assistant for his revenge than the late Darth Maul? Dooku knew that Maul was creating a disturbance on Mandalore, but now that Dooku was taking things personally, it'd be best if he teamed up with someone who'd also want the Jedi and Sith dead. Grievous was a shameful loss, but one that would be maintainable. Dooku reached out to Maul and informed him that he could provide him relief in his escape from Mandalore, for an exchange. The two of them did like each other as it was, but a mutual agreement where they could defeat Sidious and then split the galaxy between themselves was one that they could both agree to. Dooku would seize control over the Midrim and the Core, and Maul would have the entirety of the Outer Rim. As Dooku said, it could also be beneficial after they won the war to start proxy wars to ensure the other stayed in power. It didn't have to be two Sith trying to defeat the other, it very easily could be two rulers ensuring their side of the galaxy remained under their control. Maul would accept the offer, and the CIS military would blind to the Republic at Mandalore. As this was happening, Dooku called upon his reserves to the front lines. He had them in case something like this ever happened. He had millions of battleships and battle droids. He would use them, and one final touch, he needed new hands, which would be replaced while all this was transpiring. The Republic was winning on Mandalore until the entire city, all of their people, and the clones were glassed by the Separatist bombers. 
Maul was given ease of access to escape, and then the entire society of Mandalore was leveled into ash. Bo-Katan, Gar Saxon, Commander Apo, and every single Mandalorian present were reduced to skeletons in a minefield of ash and melted Beskar. Their once prideful society fell within the span of a year, and it all happened after their leader was unjustly killed by Maul. Didn't matter though, Maul had a deal that would satisfy his need for revenge and power, the head of Darth Sidious for control of the entire Outer Rim. It was a deal he was content with. The reason he had no aspirations for that type of power in the Mid-Rim or Core is that it was far too political. The Outer Rim was much more his speed, and really all he wanted. On Coruscant, more chaos was ensuing. The reports from Mandalore were coming back. At the same time, the Jedi decided that they would occupy the Senate. This meant removing Palpatine from power and taking complete control over the entire political side of the Republic. It was a move that blindsided everyone, even the newest member to the Jedi High Council. This was the original plan for the Jedi after the Battle of Coruscant. Kenobi suggested the spy mission instead of doing this, but because of what was revealed by Ahsoka from the Invisible Hand, there was no way for the Jedi to just trust Palpatine around Skywalker. This move was blindsiding to the entire galaxy, even other Jedi, because they were under the belief that the Republic would win the war. Grievous was dead and Dooku was on the run. Why wouldn't they believe that? The irony of the situation is that while the hostile takeover would be more than enough of a reason for the Republic to see the Jedi as agitators, it should have ended the war. Had Dooku been killed or captured, it would have worked, because it allowed the Jedi to peacefully interact with the Separatists as a form of government. The Jedi simply wanted to end the war, and they could tell there was something seriously wrong with Palpatine. He had all the opportunity in the galaxy to call for a ceasefire and just didn't. The entire situation was difficult. Palpatine tried to play political about the whole situation, but the Jedi found that Palpatine had Sith relics and lightsabers inside of his office, not to mention he had contingency orders for the clone army ranging from Executive Order 1 through 150. These were power plays, ones that the Senate was completely unaware of. Due to Palpatine being a Sith and clearly not a good person, the Jedi locked him in the Carbonite. His body would be hidden away inside the Jedi archives where no one had access to him. It was a secret compartment only a Grandmaster, Master of the Order, and Head Jedi archivist knew about. The Council didn't involve Anakin in this matter because at the time, he wasn't inside the temple, and because he wasn't, no need for him to worry about it. What resulted was rage from his part. He didn't understand why the Jedi would act so recklessly. What followed his outrage was the same feelings of betrayal from his wife and countless other Jedi. They couldn't believe it, but while the entire thing seemed like a coalition of power-hungry individuals trying to seize power, it was actually the saving grace for the galaxy. The Jedi Council was able to negotiate a ceasefire, and the handing over of Count Dooku and the Separatist Council. Getting that was a different story. The Jedi made everything they were doing public knowledge. They informed everyone of Palpatine's contingency orders, the fact that he was a Sith, the information revolving around the peace treaties, and literally anything else. The Jedi wanted everyone to know what they were doing and what they were doing was for the betterment of the galaxy. They took extra care in being sure that everything was well known. However, some people aren't always prepared to listen. Skywalker's anger towards the situation would peak when it forced Padme into labor. She was alright, but he blamed the Jedi for the stress of their little rebellion on her going into labor early. The irony is that even without Sidious whispering into his ear, he was playing as a pawn for the Sith Lord. Naturally, Anakin would handle the situation with maturity and a perspective on everything. He wouldn't. He would take an already tense situation and further it by taking his own drastic measures. There are around 200 Jedi that fundamentally disagree with the actions of the Council. There were another 300 Jedi that were 50-50 with the decision. Anakin rallied them together. Despite his wife handling the entire pregnancy healthy, he felt like he needed to act. Little did he realize that his actions could derail everything. The Jedi brought peace to the galaxy. The only issue is that there was a civil war brewing from inside the Separatist ranks. Dooku wasn't going quietly, even though they wanted him out, and the Separatist government now had to fend off half their own forces due to Dooku's desire for control. Anakin's result would be present enough for people to know about it. He would lead 341 Jedi to the Senate building to call for an end to the hostile takeover. When the Jedi Council rejected, a brawl began. Skywalker didn't want it to come to hostilities, but he ended up throwing the first punch. He just couldn't allow the Jedi to interrupt Palpatine's leadership. Sometimes it pays to pay attention. Skywalker and his 341 Jedi would face off against the best of the best inside the Jedi Order. The entire council rallied against Skywalker. He was out of place here, and his actions were wrong. There wouldn't be bloodshed, it would simply cost the hands of a couple Jedi and the surrender of everyone else. The council was backed by the temple guards, and the battle master Syndralic himself. 
With the full backing of the High Council and the most elite on Coruscant, Anakin's Little Rebellion would crumble right out from under him. He would be defeated in a contest with Mace Windu, and Ahsoka would lose her fight against Obi-Wan. They weren't trying to kill each other, it was just a matter of hostilities reaching a breaking point. Anakin was in the wrong, and he was too blind to see it. He was hopeful to bring peace, but it was already on the way, before he did this little rebellion. The population of the Republic saw this move as proof that the Jedi were power hungry. The people revolted, but they were suppressed by the Coruscant Guard. Despite their loyalty to the Chancellor, the new form of government was the Jedi. Technically, they were the Senate, so they served the Senate. It wasn't easy for many of them, being that the entire situation made them feel confused, but that was the simple truth of it. The Council respectively removed each of their members that betrayed them from their order. There'd be no place for such rush action in a time of peace. The situation left a sour taste in the mouths of those who watched, who partook, and those who did nothing. It was just an odd scenario. The war was coming to a close, but Dooku was on the loose. The Separatists surrendered, but there was still a conflict? Not to mention the entire Jedi Rebellion on Coruscant. But the Council pressed forward. They wouldn't let anything stop them from achieving this peace. When the war picked up, Dooku was at a disadvantage. With the Jedi holding power and scouring the galaxy after him, he found that their military had grown. The Separatists looked weak when the war nearly came to an end, and now they had a formidable force, but nothing in their arsenal prepared them for the release of Republic Star Destroyers. These ships were hard to come by, because so few had been made, but they were true weapons. Now that Dooku and Maul were on the run from two different factions, their fight became a little less maintainable but they were still pulling out victories here and there. Due to the war picking up, the Jedi slowly gave control back over to the Senate, simply because the war was over. It was a fight with a pirate state, not a government. One that had no legitimacy and had very little outside support from their inner circle. Hell, Sir Reno didn't even support Dooku. Everyone turned their backs on him and Maul, so they were in this alone. A number of months passed by since the Jedi Rebellion, and by this time, Anakin and the other Jedi that rose up with him found new home on Naboo. They saw him as a leader, and many of them decided that following him would be their best path forward. Not all of them did. Some of them believed that they were fools for following Skywalker in the battle, but a majority of them continued with him, about 300 or so. He was open about his relationship with them, and they were fine with it. This new order was built, but they didn't change the name. It was still a Jedi Order, but just connected from the one on Coruscant. Anakin found happiness here. But there was still a pull at him. The war hadn't ended, and he feared for the future his children would grow into if it was still in a galaxy consumed by war. The Jedi were effectively keeping the Separatist rebels away from victory, but it was taking too long for Dooku to be killed. In a decisive move, five months after the end of the Clone Wars and the beginning of the Count conflict, Anakin and Ahsoka made a move for Dooku and Maul. They both realized that if they were taken from the equation, they could potentially end the war. Due to how everything was being set up on Naboo, the Jedi had split their tasks and their roles. Many Jedi of the Naboo sect were out doing mercy missions, while the rest were building and finishing up the physical temple here. It wasn't much, but it was something, and it was beautiful. Anakin and Ahsoka were also the most equipped for this mission. Ever since his children were born, he felt more in harmony with himself than ever before. It took them a couple weeks to track down Dooku and Maul. They were getting tired of each other, everything had backfired, and they were constantly fighting for a chance to even gain some speck of territory. This came from Dooku, rightfully so, not expecting the CIS to turn his back on him. But he played things too close to the chest, which is why they didn't trust that he had an army reserve. Their fleet was stationed outside of a nebula, it was basically a trap, but they were waiting for reinforcements. Dooku and Maul were trying to make a strike at Kuat to try and destroy the Republic shipyards that were producing Star Destroyers. With their reinforcements came Ahsoka and Anakin, who attached themselves to a Separatist warship. They were able to move quietly to the flagship of the fleet and sneak through it. As they were doing this, they relayed information of their coordinates to Obi-Wan, the only member of the Jedi Order that they still spoke to. The Republican CIS navies were on their way. Master and Apprentice moved through the halls undetected. They could feel the surge of darkness inside the vessel. They used it as a beacon and chased it until they found Maul and Dooku. Ahsoka and Anakin didn't hold back. The lights of his netted. The two Sith moved in. The confrontation was epic. Maul and Ahsoka bounced across the bridge of the starship, while Dooku and Anakin pressed against each other. Dooku was adamant that this time he wouldn't fail. Their last fight was a setup, and Sidious wanted Anakin to win. He had no saving grace this time. Skywalker pushed back and suggested that he didn't need a saving grace this time. 
Anakin and Ahsoka were so in tandem by this point that they bounced off of each other perfectly, switching targets and simultaneously confusing the two Sith attackers. They were in perfect unison with each other. The two Sith, despite hating each other, were also working in unity, just not as well. The kicker for them was when the Republic fleet arrived at a hyperspace. They were blindsided and couldn't do anything but try and fight back so that they could escape. The rebel fleet was rattled and their commanders rallied together for a counter assault. Things only got worse for them when the CAS fleet arrived with support. One would think it'd be hard to distinguish the difference due to similar models of ships, but the former CIS had their ships painted with Republic logos to make sure they were distinguished as allies. Inside the command bridge, Anakin saw Ahsoka stagger back. Maul sees the upper hand, and she was slipping. Anakin used the force to throw Maul over a console before doubling back and spinning his lightsaber behind him, thrusting it into Dooku's stomach. Anakin backed away, knowing that Dooku would try and make the final hit before dying. He was right, and as a parting gift, he slashed down across his chest, killing him instantly. Ahsoka was able to regain her composure as Maul engaged her again. She sliced through his blade and with her shoto she cut down across his chest. Those Sith were gone, and balance had been restored, but they needed to bounce. The rebels were losing, and this was the end of their fight against the Republic. Master and Apprentice would be able to make a cunning escape before their capital ship was blown to shreds. The Sith were gone, and the Republic found victory after five more months of combat. But the tensions were not finished yet. The Jedi and the Republic mutually agreed that the Jedi religion would have no more impact on politics ever again. Likewise, the Republic would put forward measures to ensure that their fragile system couldn't be overtaken by a maniac obsessed with power. With all the time having passed since the rebellion on Coruscant, Anakin issued a formal apology to the Jedi Order. He realized that he in that moment was in the wrong. He and Ahsoka in particular had no interest in rejoining their Jedi Order, but they requested that anyone who was a part of their movement that wanted to rejoin could be allowed to. He saw that his actions were wrong and he didn't want anything negative to exist between their two orders. But the Jedi had already forgiven him. They knew how it looked, but that was the price of their action. They were doing it to save the people. It was like their attachment rule. It wasn't that attachment was bad, it was that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The Jedi couldn't be afraid to make the hard choices, and that's what they did. They knew not everyone would agree with it, but they had to do it to end the war. Instead of both Jedi Orders being separate, the Council suggested that Anakin's be considered a splinter group of the Jedi Order, associated but not directly the same. He agreed to that notion, and so Anakin would be able to have the best of both worlds. He could be a Jedi Master and have his family openly without having to hide it. Skywalker and Tano would continue to instruct as members and leaders of the Naboo sect of the Jedi Order. Some members would transfer over and others would return to Coruscant. The important thing is that both sides were at peace and everything was established. The war was over, and according to Padme, the Republic was right on track. When the Jedi moved on the Senate, it woke people up and they realized what they were doing wrong. They now had the perfect opportunity to right those wrongs, and that's exactly what they did. Anakin's own life would be full of more highs. Of course there would be lows too, but every time they came he adjusted with maturity and perspective. His twins would grow up as Jedi, and they would continuously be happy, as the galaxy around them reshaped into a new golden era. And that my friends is our story, again special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jango Fett clone, the Big Red Pyramark, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalor, Sir William 1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Anakin Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Safe Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunlink 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Forest League, League Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Man 3 First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you want to support me in other ways. Go check out the Patreon early access to super cool things on there, as well as animations. Got a new one in the works. Super excited for that. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. The concept of getting Ahsoka to go to Coruscant is just really hard, but I think if the words were played right, I think she might just kind of agree to it, like be real on the fence but last second decide, and I wanted the effect to be drastic. The idea of having Dooku escape the invisible hand but Grievous die seemed kind of interesting and I felt like her being present would help that play into action. And so with Dooku escaping, I think his support had run out. You see in Bad Batch that people in Sereno stopped caring for him, and I feel like that'd be present across the entirety of the spectrum of the Separatist movement, and so I wanted that to be present in the story. I also thought that him and Maul having a dynamic would be interesting, but I don't think it would actually work for anything. As for Ahsoka and Anakin's dynamic, I think they'd play hand in hand with each other, 
and I think Ahsoka's disdain for the Jedi would kind of play into Anakin, which is why it would lead to Anakin kind of feeling like he could have a Jedi Rebellion himself, and that falling short. Anyways, let me know what you thought down below, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.